Have you ever been so excited about something that you had to react to it? Maybe your favorite team won it all, like mine did, the Rangers, just recently. Uh, I, I remember it was just like we just ran. I've been thinking back on it. I've just, I've just been drawn on it every day. It's, it's just been great. Um, in the moment that they won, I didn't have as much of a response to it because I was just so shocked that this is something I've been waiting for since I was seven years old. I just couldn't believe that they actually won. So I kind of just, I was just like there, just staring. And I, and I almost started crying because I just couldn't believe that they won. But through the playoff run, that was, that was so much fun. It was so much fun to just watch them be winning. And I was like, oh my gosh, we might actually do it this year. I was, and I was reacting to every game that they won to. But here's the thing. Every game that was on was during Noel, my daughter's nap time, or she was sleeping. So either it was during the afternoon when she's having her day nap, or it was at nighttime when she's asleep. So I had to stay quiet. That was rough. That was real rough. So if they win a game, I'm, 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 I'm just silent screaming. I'm just like, yeah. And I'm just like, and, and she was just looking at me. She's just like, don't. Do it. Don't yell. Don't yell. God. I just couldn't believe it. So I'm, I, I just couldn't help but respond to it. We, hum, we as human beings are made this way by God. To have emotional reactions to things. But he did not create us to stop thinking when we have these emotional reactions. I had to remember to be quiet while I was celebrating so I wouldn't wake Noel. Although once I got caught up and I did yell because uh, I was during uh, Evan Carter made this uh, catch with Alex Bergman. Hit the ball out, and it looked like the Astros were going to take the lead, and Evan Carter just reaches up and grabs it. I lost it. I was just, I couldn't believe it, because I, I was like, this is the game. We're going to lose, and then he caught it, and I was just so excited, and I yelled, and that did not go well with Shelby, because <laughs> I woke up Noel. <laughs> I, could, I could start hearing her cry. I'm like, oh my gosh, I felt so bad. But... God has made us to have strong emotions over things, but at the same time, allow our thinking to continue so that we will think rightly. This is exactly what happens to Mary as she continues to see the work of the Lord in her life and for her people. She goes to visit her cousin, Elizabeth, who is pregnant with John the Baptist, and she is overcome with emotion, yet at the same time, she continues to think and ends up writing a beautiful, true, God-glorifying psalm to the Lord. So let's look at Luke 1, 46 through 55. Verse 46 says, And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of the servant, for behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. This song is called the Magnificat. It comes from the Latin term meaning to magnify, which is exactly what this song does. Now, some say Mary could not have written it because she was too young. She was a teenager when all this is happening. But this forgets the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. 
the Holy Spirit gave Mary the words to glorify God. He gave her the perfect theology to sing. This song also demonstrates that Mary knew her Bible. For this song has quotes or allusions to many different Old Testament books and other Israelite hymns. Mary gleaned from that entirety of the Old Testament to write this song. My first point is God is magnified. First, I want you to see that Mary's main concern is to glorify and exalt God. She starts by saying, my soul magnifies the Lord. My soul magnifies the Lord. This is referring to her entire being. Everything she is wants to magnify the Lord. She, she's going deep within herself, saying every fiber of my being wants to make God big. Wants to make people see him as big. Because he is only big, right? But she wants to magnify him. But what, is, what does the term magnify mean? To magnify is to make larger, right? But it can do it two ways, like a microscope or a telescope. We magnify God like a telescope. We take something that is huge, but people think is small, and show him for how huge he is. This is what Mary is doing now. Her desire is to make God look huge for people with her praise. She does this by focusing on, on some attributes of God. We'll look at four of them. First one in verse 49 is mighty. Verse 49 says, For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. She is praising him for his power. Power that brings a baby from a virgin woman. God is omnipotent. That means all powerful. God can make things happen that can't normally happen because he's great and mighty. Number two is holiness. She is praising him for being completely other and perfect, just like her son would be. Let that sink in for a minute. Her son. Is holy. He is God in flesh. Number three, mercy. This is found in verse 50. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. She is praising him for his love for sinners. This whole first coming that Jesus is doing, that God sent Jesus to do, is to save sinners. It's, as we're going to continue to talk about, turning the world upside down. Number four, faithfulness. Also found in verse 15. Let's read it again. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. She praises him for keeping his promises. This promise of Jesus was from back in Genesis. All the way back when God told Satan, you will bruise his, you will bruise his heel, and you will, but he, you will bruise his heel, but he will bruise your head. He will conquer it. She is, she is remembering all the way back then. She desires for people through her song to see the Lord for as huge as he is. This should be what we do with our lives. We should do this as well. We should magnify the Lord with what we say and do. Mary is worshiping God with her song, yes, but make no mistake, 
She started worshiping the Lord when she said, let it be done to me as you have said. That willingness to obey was an act of worship. We can magnify the Lord and worship him with more than just praise songs. We can do it through obedience. Obedience is another way, and I would even argue and say the primary way we worship God, by obeying him. How you live your life matters. You can magnify what you believe by how you live your life. In, in other words, when trouble comes your way, how do you respond? Think about that. Do you complain and grumble that things aren't going your way? If so, if so then you are magnifying yourself as the most important thing. But if you respond as a servant of the Lord and say, let it be done to me as you have said, you magnify the Lord. I don't know about you, but I struggle deeply to magnify the Lord when things aren't going my way. That's rough. To have that attitude and trust in the Lord that he knows what he's doing and that everything that's happening to you is for a reason, for your good and for his praise, his glory. But I need to remind myself in those moments that I am on this earth to magnify the Lord. And he truly has done great things for me and for you. Because what it really comes down to when I act like that is pride. I'm being prideful and making it about me. When instead, I ought to be humble and let God lift me up at the right time, which this leads me to my next point. God lifts up the humble. There are two main themes in this song that demonstrate all of these attributes that we just spoke of. It is that God lifts up the humble and God humbles the proud. Let's look at him lifting up the humble first. In verse 48, for he who has looked on the humble estate of his servant, for behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. Mary, of course, is the perfect example of this. As we saw last week, from a world perspective, Mary was a nobody. But because she was humble, the Lord raises her. Listen, guys, you don't need to talk yourself up or accomplish something to have the Lord. Honestly. The world's going to tell you that. Make something of yourself, right? Make it in the world. That phrase can be damaging if you think too much about it. If you think, I need to make something of myself in order to be worth something. It's not true. Your work comes from God's love for you. That's where you find your work. So let's all stop trying to make ourselves look great and instead allow God to lift us up at the right time. He will exalt you at the right time, but you must first be a servant. In verse 47, she mentions that she needs a savior like every other sinner. She says, and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. Mary was not sinless, and it's not as if Jesus was coming for everyone except Mary. No, she claims herself that she has a savior. This baby she is about to bear will become her savior. He does great things for her as he does to all who humble themselves before him. God has written out your story and how your life will go. And he plans to do great things for you. Honestly. Now, they may not be great in the eyes of the world, but they are great in the Whatever God decides.
decides to do with your life is a great thing. I've spoken with many of you. I know a lot of you are afraid about your futures. You don't know what you're going to do. You don't know what career path you want. And, and shoot, you know, you could be in your 30s and still say, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what's going on. That's okay. You're doing great things. That's another important thing to remember. Don't think that you have to go do something great. Living your life, if you're obeying the Lord, honoring Him, you're doing great things because it's through his strength. And 49 ends with, and holy is his name. Don't let that be an afterthought statement. Mary is summing up the first four verses of this song by declaring God as holy or set apart. Because why did this holy and set apart God choose to do great things and bless Mary? Because she was good in herself? No. Because she has a Savior who will cover her sins. She is saying, only this holy and set apart God can do all these great things for me. Only Him. This is why Mary was called blessed in verse 48. Because she was highly graced by God. Listen to this very carefully. God always shows mercy to those who humble themselves and fear Him. Always. That's the key to blessing. Humble yourselves. Be a servant of the Lord. Fear Him in reverence. Remember when we studied James? Let's quickly look at James 4.10. You can turn if you want or just let me read it. James 4.10 says, Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. That's a promise. If you humble yourself before the Lord, if you think about yourself less and think about God more, he will exalt you. He will lift you up. If you want a life that is blessed like what Mary is talking about, you must learn humility and fear of the Lord. Be reverent to him and his holiness and might. Otherwise, you will be like the proud and be humbled by God. That's my final point. God humbles the proud. Let's look at what God does to the proud. He humbles them. Now, when I say humble here, I mean he knocks them off their self-made thrones to demonstrate that he rules. In verses 51 through 52a, let's read that. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones. She is probably referring to how Yahweh has delivered Israel over and over again in the past. Yet, she is also thinking of what Yahweh will do in the future through the Messiah. But she never uses the future tense. And that little odd? I believe that she is doing what we see people of faith doing much in the Old Testament. Using past tense language to refer to future things. It is them saying that the promises of God are so trustworthy that they are as good as fulfilled. God has come to establish his kingdom with his justice and through his son, who is king. This requires him to overthrow every nation and every proud heart that is in rebellion to him or is defiant to him. He must subdue everything and everyone that opposes his rule and kingdom. Notice what specifically is overthrown. Three things. Verse 51, prideful intellect. 
It says he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. So he's overthrown prideful intellect. Number two, prideful position. Verse 52, he has brought down the mighty from their thrones. Number three, prideful wealth. Found in verse 53. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. Um, now, hold on. Now with non-believers, they are knocked off their thrones and shown, her, shown who God truly is and then they will be punished for their pride. Okay? But here's the beauty of the gospel. Here's the beauty of what Jesus came to do. When Christians choose disobedience, they are humbled too. And that's actually really good news. But it's because it's not in order to punish them. It's in order to discipline them into becoming better followers of Christ. Jesus came to also knock us off our thrones we have made for ourselves because he loves us too much to let us live forever in our false, corrupted kingdoms. It's a beautiful thing. It's a painful thing. But it's a beautiful thing that God is doing. He won't allow you to live a life in your own corrupted kingdom. He wants you to live in the true kingdom, his kingdom. He wants us to follow the true king of kings and humble ourselves before him. This is always a hard and painful process, but God is doing a beautiful thing in our hearts and he started this process when he came as a little baby lying in the manger. In verse 54, Mary mentions mercy a second time when she says, I thought that was interesting when I was looking at this. Why do you think she mentions mercy in both verse 50 and 54? I think because this entire concept of Jesus coming to the world and being born is an act of mercy. He's not giving us what we deserve. But instead, he's gracing us with salvation. We deserve to be forgotten and abandoned because of our sin. But that's not how God works. Instead of leaving us hopeless, which is what we deserve, he gives us his son to be the savior of the world. That is why we celebrate Christmas. Because the savior of the world has come to save us from our sins. God, through his son, the Messiah, would turn the world upside down. The strong would be made weak, and the weak would be made strong. He fills the hungry and needy with good things and tears down those who think they don't need him. God is magnified in this song, and it still does work today. I'm going to close with this. Martin Luther wrote about this song. He says, the great works and deeds of God for the strengthening of our faith, for the comforting of all those of low degree, and for the terrifying of all the mighty ones of earth. We are to let the hymn serve its purpose. For she sang, sang it, not for herself alone, but for us all, to sing it after her. Have you ever felt forgotten? Lowly in spirit? felt like things were not going well in your life and God just didn't care. He didn't hear you, didn't see you. I've been there. I know what that's like. It can be scary. But this song is telling us that we're never forgotten. We're never cast aside. Because the proof of that is that Jesus came down to be born to save us. 
Maybe you relate to Mary and you, you feel lowly in spirit. But remember, God has done great things in your life. And he will continue to do great things in your life because he loves you. You're never forgotten. You're never alone. He sees you.